All right, so let's get started with the math component of the first lecture. So this is the class on algebraic groups. So first of all, as a reminder, what's a group? Well, a group is a set uh, with an associative operation. So we think of this operation as a map from G cross G to G. So for every pair of elements in G, we get a new element in G. And this operation has the property that there exists um, uh, identity element, a unit in the, in the group, and a bijection from G to G, which encodes inverses. And these satisfy the following identities. So the, um, the, the, if you multiply anything by the identity, you get itself on either side. And if you multiply anything by its inverse, then you get the identity. And you can multiply on the left by the inverse or on the right by the inverse. So, yeah. So that's what a group is. So you've seen examples of groups like the symmetric groups, the hydro groups, finite cyclic groups, finite, finitely generated abelian groups, uh, and so on, and some infinite groups like the integers. And many of you have, are, have probably seen Lie groups in the context of uh, differential geometry. So a Lie group is a smooth manifold. So now it's more than just a set. It's a, it's a manifold. It has extra structure. Uh, and it's, it's equipped with an associative operation that makes it a group. So we have uh, a map mu like before and a map i that encodes the inverses. And now these are not just any maps, but they are smooth maps, smooth maps between smooth manifolds. And maybe you've seen some examples of Lie groups. So for example, the general linear group of all invertible n by n matrices with entries in the real numbers. So that's an example of a Lie group. It has the manifold structure. So what about algebraic groups? So what is an algebraic group? So I'll, I'll flash the definition now and we'll uh, devote the, the, probably not today, but the next lecture about understanding this definition. So an algebraic group is an algebraic variety equipped with the structure of a group. So just like a Lie group was a smooth manifold that also had the, the operation and the identity and inverse, an algebraic group is now an algebraic variety that has um, an operation and an inverse operation and, um, and now these maps mu and i have to be maps of algebraic varieties, morphisms of algebraic varieties. So today we'll review what is an algebraic variety and what are morphisms between algebraic varieties. So um, there'll be some reminders. So in this class, first of all, we, we need to cover enough algebraic geometry to make sense of that, this definition. So that's what we'll start with. And once we get a get a handle for the definition and for what the background is, we want to we want to have a, a big set of examples to play around with. So I'll talk about many examples of algebraic groups, and as we go through the course, we'll go back to these examples and examine various properties. So we'll be interested in uh, the structure of algebraic groups and reductive, especially reductive algebraic groups. We'll see that there's very rich structure. And we'll also be interested in representation theory. So um, here we'll, we'll talk about things like roots and weights and how to combinatorially classify representations of algebraic groups. Okay, so some motivation for, for this subject so I want to share with you a quote from Milne, which are in those notes. Uh, without too much exaggeration, one can say that all the theory of algebraic groups does is show, oh, there's a typo there, sorry, is show that the theory of Killing and Cartan for local objects over C extends in a natural way to global objects over arbitrary fields. So if you're, maybe this uh, theory of Killing and, and, and Cartan is not something you've seen, but the idea is that the, in, the, um, in the development of the subject, first people understood things over, over C and how, how things work there. But then um, there was 
an import of these uh, techniques from algebraic geometry, which allowed to generalize phenomena that happen over C or over R uh, to, to more general fields. So yeah, so many of the groups of interest, so like uh, the classical groups or finite groups um, can be defined and understood using algebraic geometry. So that's the idea. And the advantages of this is that it gives a more uniform approach uh, to studying many different groups over many different fields. So we, we're not restricted to just the real numbers or the complex numbers. Uh, and formulating things in terms of algebraic geometry uh, precipitates connections to number theory and to mathematical physics and uh, other sorts of applications. So, uh, for example, uh, in the mathematical physics side, quantum groups, the theory of quantum groups emerges out of the theory of algebraic groups quite naturally. All right, so that's some words of motivation. So I'll say some things about the, the running example of the, gen, of the two by two general linear group. So our first, this is our first example of an of a algebraic group. So first of all, we'll be working in this class over an algebraically closed field. Um, there's, yeah, there's, um, various ways to uh, uh, drop the assumption of algebraically closed, but for the, for the scope of this class, we'll be assuming that the ground field K is algebraically closed. And since we always have a ground field, I'm not gonna include it um, here in the notation. It's understood that, it's, that these are uh, uh, matrices over K. And the general linear group is all, uh, the general linear group GL2 is all two by two invertible matrices. And I wanna just write down a few important subgroups of GL2. So first of all, we have the diagonal matrices. Uh, these are defined by the equation setting B equals to zero and C equals to zero. Uh, and this forms what's known as a maximal torus of GL2. So that's something we'll discuss later. Uh, and you can, yeah, and A and D have to be in invertible elements, so non-zero elements of the field. So this is just really two copies of the multiplicative group of the field. Another important example is upper triangular matrices. So this is what's known as a Borel subgroup of GL2. Uh, so now again, it, it contains diagonal matrices, but we're also allowed to put a non-zero entry in the top right. And that, yeah, it could be zero, in which case we get a diagonal element, but it could be something general. And another important subgroup is the subgroup SL2, which is just matrices with determinant one. Uh, so yeah, so those are some examples that um, we'll explore in more detail what, it, what these examples mean for general groups. And as I said, we'll be interested in representations of linear algebraic groups. So, um, in most, so what is the representation? First of all, well, before giving the general definition, an example of a representation of GL2, our running example, is its action on two-dimensional space K2. So if we have a, a, an element in the two-dimensional space K2, we think of it as a vector, we can multiply a matrix by a vector and get a new vector. And this is a, this is a linear tr transformation by definition, pretty much. So that's why it, it defines a representation. Uh, and in general, a representation of GO2 is an action of GO2 on a vector space, such that each element in GO2 acts by a linear map. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, that's, it's not just any sort of uh, permutation of the elements of the vector space, it has to preserve the structure. Uh, and in this case, that means having a linear action. So we'll give a more precise definition uh, probably in the second lecture. And if we have a representation if, or if we have some collections of representations, we can build new representations by taking direct sums tensor products, symmetric and exterior powers, and so forth. 
Uh, and we'll especially be interested in irreducible representations. So these are representations that can't be broken down into uh, smaller pieces. Uh, so if, if, uh, if um, yeah, uh, uh, so, and basically if, if we know the irreducible representations of a group, we know a lot about the group itself. And um, for GL2, these can be understood combinatorially in terms of irreducible representations of the center, which are just scalar matrices, and irreducible representations of SL2, which are indexed by the uh, positive integers. Um, so we, we'll be interested in classification results for irreducible representations of algebraic groups. And why, why is this important? Why do people care about representations? Uh, there are many reasons, uh, one of which is these in, in sort of in nature, in, in physics or in, in, in applications to uh, number theory or to more uh, applied math like Fourier analysis and so forth. The groups really appear through their representations. Um, you, you start with some collection of vector spaces with an action and from there you, you can deduce kind of what the group can be. And there's a, there's a principle um, that uh, one can recover a group through its representation. So this is known as uh, Tanakian reconstruction, Tanakian duality. Uh, it's a very interesting subject and it, maybe we'll touch on it um, at some point in the course. So, um, so representations I want to emphasize are linear actions of the group, but sometimes we have actions that are not linear, but that have a more geometric component. So for example, uh, the quotient of GO2 mod, uh, the quotient GO2 mod B, so uh, B was a subgroup of upper triangular matrices, uh, is isomorphic to the uh, one dimensional projective space over K. And the way to see this is to think about the action of GO2 on one dimensional projective space. Um, and this is an action that's, that's geometric and it's not, not a representation, it's not a linear action. Uh, but we can get a lot of information from actions such as this one, the, these geometric actions. And uh, if we define this action, we see that the stabilizer of one zero of these are homogeneous coordinates on P1. We'll review uh, projective space and projective varieties later today. So don't be too intimidated if you um, are not familiar with this notation. And also this action is transitive. So whenever we have a uh, group acting transitively on a, on a set, or in this case, an algebraic variety, then uh, this, that algebraic variety is isomorphic to the group mod the stabilizer of a point. So this, this is the idea behind why G, G mod B in this case is isomorphic to P1. Um, and you may have seen this action in the context of Mobius transformations on the Riemann sphere. And in that formulation, the stabilizer of infinity uh, is B. So if you've seen that, you can relate it. If not, then it's not important. So um, if we have a, a algebraic group, I'll say what linear means later on, but if we have an algebraic group and a Borel subgroup, then it turns out that this quotient G mod B uh, is a projective variety. And it's a, it's, a, it's a very important variety and it relates to the structure of G and it relates to the representation theory of G. Uh, and it's known as the flag variety. So we'll, we'll see why it's called the flag variety. But the, the point of this slide is to, to uh, illustrate that we'll be thinking about uh, group actions on interesting varieties and how they, how, they give, how they will give us information about the group itself and its representations. Okay, and in terms of the structure of algebraic groups, um, so the, the ones with the richest structure are reductive groups. And I like this, um, this, this is taken from Milne's notes. 
So you can think of uh, uh, an algebraic group as a butterfly. And this, this sort of uh, way of thinking about things goes back to Grothendieck, I believe. And the, the body of the butterfly is the maximal torus T. So in, in the case of GO2, we have the diagonal matrices. Those are kind of the, the body, what's in the, in the center. Not the center mathematically, just the center of the object. Uh, and then the wings are the are opposite Borel subgroups. So for the case of GO2, we have the upper triangular and lower triangular matrices. Those are both examples of Borel subgroups and they're opposites to each other, uh, which in this case means that their intersection is just a torus. And we have these pins in the butterfly and those are supposed to reflect the root system so this is a, the root system will be, is a combinatorial gadget. Uh, and it's, it's sort of discrete data, some points in a vector space that will have some symmetry. And fixing the, the root system kind of uh, uh, rigidifies the situation. And uh, this also leads to a classification result. So if we, if we know enough about the root system, then we can say exactly which group we have. So uh, a group is uh, determined in some sense by its root system. There's a bit more, it's called the root datum. There's a bit more than just the root system. Uh, but that's, that's the idea that these thinking about root systems gives us a classification result for reductive groups. So that's just one class of, of algebraic groups that have rich structure. Okay, so uh, that was a lot of material. I hope I, I um, gave a sense without losing anybody in the details. Are there any questions so far? Okay. Um, okay, no questions in the chat. So, so for the rest of the of today, I want to talk about some algebraic geometry. So I want so at, at the end of the day, um, everybody should have some sort of understanding of what the Zariski topology is. If you don't know already, what's an affine algebra and an affine variety? What's a variety, a general variety, not just affine? What's the morphism between varieties? what's projective space and what's a projective variety. So, yeah. All right, so let's move on to that. Okay, so now I'm gonna share the, whoops, what happened? Um, for some reason, okay, just a second. Okay, there we go. So, uh, I'm the way I'm going to lecture is I know this may not be the optimal solution. I may adapt and try other things later on, but um, I'm gonna, I have handwritten notes that, that I've um, scanned and uploaded there on the website and I'll go through them um, slowly uh, during the lecture. And I apologize in advance for my handwriting. I'll try to, <laughs> Keep it readable from time to time. I, I inserted these headings and, and other things to, to alleviate the situation a little bit. Um, I, I can just tell you that it, this handwriting is better than what it would be if I was drawing on my uh, tablet. Uh, my handwriting seems to get a lot worse on tablets. Uh, so yeah, so again, please feel free to stop me at any time. Um, uh, and ask questions. Um, so let's get started. So the first thing we want to talk about is 
the Zariski topology. So again, we're, we'll be uh, working over uh, an algebraically closed field uh, denoted K. And we wanna start by thinking about a vector space of dimension N over K. So V is just K to the N, vector space of dimension N over K. And we're, we're gonna think about elements of V as just N tuples of elements of K. So each VI is an element of K. Um, uh, by the way, so as I mentioned earlier, the, these notes are on the website, so you can go there and follow along um, at, at your own pace if you want to peek ahead or go back to something. So um, we have V, which is the vector space of dimension N. We have S, which is uh, the polynomial algebra and N variables over K. So uh, we have T1 through Tn, those are just formal variables. We think about uh, all sorts of algebraic combinations and those, gives us, those give us polynomials and this forms an algebra. We can multiply and add and subtract uh, these polynomials. And so uh, this polynomial algebra is, uh, we can think of it as defining functions on the vector space V of dimension N. So more specifically, we have an evaluation map. So if we, if we have a, a pair of function and a vector in this vector space, we can evaluate the vector, um, we can evaluate the function at the vector. So we just plug in VI for TI and multiply out. So this is just evaluation of polynomials, nothing, nothing too scary. Uh, but this will be the basis of, of what comes next. So in order to define the Zariski topology, we first define the closed sets. So the closed sets are defined as follows. So if we have an ideal I in S, S being the polynomial algebra, then we can think about all points in the vector space uh, such that F of X equals zero for all uh, polynomials in the ideal. So the, the, uh, this is kind of the common vanishing set for all the elements of the ideal. So often we may think about an ideal that can, that's generated by one element. So we just have some polynomial in the T, in the T say like T1 squared plus T3 uh, plus five. Uh, so that's, that's a polynomial. And then this, the, it generates an ideal and the vanishing set for that ideal is just all the solutions of that polynomial. All the, all the elements in V that go to zero in that polynomial. Uh, so this cuts out a, a, a subset of V and these are known as the algebraic subsets of V. So the idea is that this, this, uh, this function is an algebraic piece of information and it cuts out a subset of V. Um, so these are the closed sets and the open sets so i'll tell you so the open sets are defined as the the, the complement of the closed sets and you can verify that uh, these give a basis for the topology that's I, I won't go into that here but that's what happens but it's important to know um, what uh, a basis for the open sets are uh, so these come about if you take just any, any element in S, so any polynomial, and you look at all the points in the vector space that evaluate to a non-zero number in that, in that, uh, in that, um, uh, under that polynomial. So this is the complement of the vanishing set of the ideal generated by F. Uh, and these are known as the principal open sets. Oh yeah, my handwriting is pretty horrible. Sorry about that. Principal open sets of, of V. So anytime we have a polynomial, we have this principal open set where it's, it's non-vanishing uh, locus. Okay, and this gives us the Zariski topology. And some more things about the Zariski topology. So first of all, uh, uh, an ideal is called radical. It's a radical ideal if, it, if it's closed undertaking uh, roots. So more formally, if uh, 
if I coincides with the set of, of polynomials in S, S is still a polynomial algebra, such that some power of F is an I. So in other words, if we know that some power of a polynomial is an I, then necessarily that original polynomial must be an I. So for example, if we had a polynomial algebra in one variable, T, then uh, the ideal generated by T squared is not radical because it doesn't uh, contain T, but T squared uh, is contained in the ideal. Okay. And if we, um, if we have, so this, this definition already appeared. So if we have an ideal, then its vanishing set is, is given as follows. But we can also go the other way. So if we have any subset, doesn't need to be an algebraic subset, any subset, then we can define um, its corresponding ideal, which is the set of all uh, polynomials that vanish at all points in X. So um, if to, to kind of make sense of, of, of these two definitions, it's helpful to think back at that evaluation map we had before, S cross V to the base field. So you, we basically just think about the different factors in that map. Um, and so the, the kind of the fundamental diagram we have uh, in terms of the uh, Zariski topology on on this vector space V is the following. So I, I explain how if we have a subset, then we get an ideal, but it turns out that that, that ideal will be radical. So that's an easy exercise uh, in algebraic geometry. And if we have an ideal, we get a, a subset of V and by definition, it will be an algebraic subset. So uh, we get this, so the upshot is we get a, order reversing bijection between algebraic subsets of V and radical ideals of S, that should say ideals. Um, okay. So that's kind of the summary of what happens with um, Zariski, with Zariski topology. Any questions on that? Okay, again, feel free just to unmute yourself and ask a question at any point. All right, so then moving along, we have um, the concept of affine algebras. So here the idea is that um, uh, what, we, what we did just now is we took a vector space and inside the vector space, we considered all the, the subsets, what I call algebraic subsets that are cut out by polynomials uh, in the, the polynomial algebra and, and variables. So we have these subsets, but the, but the idea is that um, we can think about these uh, subsets in a more intrinsic way. So if, if we have a subset that's embedded in one vector space, it could be, uh, we want to identify it with a, with a similar embedding, with an equivalent embedding in a different vector space. So we want to have an intrinsic uh, characterization of these algebraic sets. So this is similar to what happens in manifold theory. We want to think about manifolds uh, intrinsically, not always embedded. Okay, so to do that, uh, the way to do that is to think about algebra, to think about associating an algebra to each algebraic set. So if we have an algebraic set X inside of V, V still being KN, vector space of dimension N, then its affine algebra will be the quotient of the polynomial algebra by this ideal of functions that are that vanish at all sets at, at all points in the set X. Um, so, and the intuition is that if we have some functions that, that vanish on X, then they don't they don't give us any information about X. So we we, we can mod out by them and still have the same uh, notion of functions on X. Um, so that's the affine algebra. Of, of x, just this quotient. And so right now it looks like it depends on the embedding. It looks like, uh, because we needed this, we needed the embedding to define it, but we'll see that it's the important properties of x are entirely contained in this algebra. And um, 
those properties are, are preserved if we embed X into a different um, vector space. So, okay, so let me be more precise. So uh, X and its Zariski uh, topology are determined by this algebra KX. And so this algebra um, gives us an intrinsic description of X. This could be one presentation of this algebra or it could have a different presentation, but I, it, we, we would still get the, an isomorphic algebra if we have a different embedding. I hope that, that makes sense. A small question. Sure. As a novice in algebraic geometry, so does this affine and algebra and somehow separate the points of, of X? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They do? Great. Thank you. Yeah. So this is uh, what, we're, what I was about to say. So there's a bijection between um, the points of X. Uh, so here we just think about, I mean, set theoretically, no, no real topology right now. Uh, and the uh, maximal ideals of this algebra. So this is max, th yeah, this is just the notation for maximal ideals. And I, the, the, the way we get this bijection is we send X to the maximal ideal that's, that's all functions that vanish at X um, inside the affine algebra. Um, and yeah. And yeah, and you can think about why this is a bijection, why we get an arrow the other way. Uh, this is, you say, that this is a ring, right? Yeah. The X, mm -hmm. X is a ring. So, mm -hmm. but in this ring, all the polynomials are vanished on the setting. Uh, yeah, that's correct. But this is uh, 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 the the functions that vanish at a single point. I so, okay. Yeah, th these are the the functions. So I didn't have before. I had for all at little x and x. Uh, so that would be zero. But if I have just one little x, then not all the functions will vanish at little x. There will be some uh, subset that that vanish at little x, and that'll be a maximum ideal. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So now I see that, in fact, I have two copies of this page for some reason. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, okay. So, so that was, so this, this first point that I made about the bijection between the points of X and the maximum ideals. As I said, that's kind of set theoretic. That just sets, these two sets are in bijection. But what about the topology? Well, um, we can think about the topology. So first of all, uh, if we embed X, it has, a, it has a subset topology, but we can recover that subset topology just from the uh, algebra functions uh, KX. And we can, we can uh, recover it in the following way. Uh, the closed sets are um, the points uh, where, so the closed sets are kind of indexed by the ideals of this algebra. And for every ideal, we look at all the points that vanish at all, uh, point, at all elements of that ideal. So any, any, any uh, F in the ideal gives us a function on X and we can think about all the points that vanish uh, for all the functions in the ideal. So it's it, the, the sort of the, the quantifiers all, whether we're thinking about all points in X or all ideals, it's, 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 it can be kind of confusing, but once you have it straight, it should make sense. Um, yeah. And so those are the closed sets. And I wanted to make a note about the principal open sets. So before we talked about principal open sets in the vector space K to the N, but we can also think about principal open sets in, in X. And those are given uh, as follows. So if we have uh, F in this the affine algebra, KX of, 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 um, of X, then we can think about all points where uh, that function is non-zero. And that's the principal open set. Okay. 
So that's the idea about affine algebras. Uh, let me let me say one thing. I guess I didn't write it here, but in the in the Zariski topology, um, these open sets sets tend to be big. So if you're if it's uh, um, in in many cases, let me not say the, the exact assumptions, but in many cases the these open sets are dense. Um, so any any uh, any two open sets will intersect. Which is not true in the usual topology for uh, uh, R to the N, say. Okay, uh, so some terminology. Um, an affine K algebra is a K algebra satisfying the two the following two uh, conditions. So first of all, it's commutative, and it's finally generated as a K algebra. And second of all, it's reduced. It has no non-zero no potent elements. That's what reduced means. Um, so it, it, it could still be uh, not an integral domain. So integral domains are rings with no zero divisors. So affine K algebras could have zero divisors, but they have no non-zero no potent elements. Uh, and they're commutative and finally generated as a K algebra. So not necessarily as a K module, that's very strong, but as a K algebra. And the upshot here is that the affine algebra of any algebraic set is an affine K algebra. And you can think about why that's true. It, it amounts to picking and embedding to see the finite generation and observing that Ix is a radical ideal and that it's just simple commutative algebra implies that this algebra is reduced. Can I ask another simple question? Sure, sure. Just that, um... Saying that the algebra is reduced is the same as saying that the intersection of all maximal and all prime ideals is trivial. Is um, I, yeah, that's the the radical, the Jacobson radical. Yeah, but mm -hmm. it's commutative. So, so, so saying that the intersection is zero is saying like, um, that the x is the union of all its points. Okay, thank you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If you think back to uh, the statement there with the bijection between X and the maximum ideals, it, it goes back to saying that if a function vanishes on all the points, then it must then be it zero. Then it vanishes on the point. Okay, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, so, okay, so if we have an algebraic set, it's affine algebra is an affine K algebra. Uh, on the other hand, if we have an affine K algebra, then there exists an algebraic set X with uh, A as its affine algebra. So the upshot is we get a bijection between algebraic sets over K and affine K algebras. So um, yeah, this is this is this is kind of nice. So we can we can translate some. Uh, uh, maybe topological questions into algebraic questions, and we can translate algebraic questions into topological questions. And um, this is a uh, this is a nice bijection. And um, later, we'll we'll enhance this somehow. We'll talk about uh, maps between algebraic sets and maps between affine K algebras, K algebra homomorphisms. And um, this actually uh, enhances to an equivalence of categories. I'm not gonna, I, there's no category that's assumed for this class, so I won't delve on it, but maybe some, some of you are taking Rami's class on category theory. This is uh, uh, an example of, of an equivalence of categories, but ignore, ignore categories if you haven't seen them. And just in terms of names, this, mm -hmm. the, the theorem that this is actually a bijection is called Noto's normalization theorem, or something like that. That every affine K algebra is the, the quotient of a polynomial algebra. Uh, I'm not sure what uh, who, okay, never who this theorem is attributed to. Um, yeah. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, I wanna I wanna uh, say a few words about reducibility. This will probably not be too important in, in what comes next. So um, 
Uh, but let me just say a few words because it may come up in, in some later things. So this is a different notion of reducibility than the algebra being reduced. It, the terminology is kind of confusing. I hope you can keep it straight. So a topological space is called reducible if it's the union of two proper closed sets. So basically if we have two closed sets and they and the topological space and they don't intersect or disjoint and we can separate um, uh, the space out in this way. Uh, and if we have um, uh, a general topological space, maybe it's reducible, but inside we have irreducible subsets. Um, and the components of a topological space are its maximal irreducible subsets. So we, we think about, yeah, we, if we take the union of two um, irreducible subsets, um, then it'll all again be irreducible. And so we, there's a well-defined notion of maximal and uh, those are called the irreducible components of a topological space. Now, if X is uh, um, an algebraic space, so one of these uh, closed subsets, um, then we always know that X will have finite many irreducible components and they're, they're, they're closed in X and together they cover X. So somehow we can have, uh, th this, is, this is a nice finiteness assumption. So we can, if we, if we wanna make some argument about algebraic varieties, we know that they have uh, finitely, um, not algebraic varieties in general, algebraic spaces. We know that they have finitely many irreducible components and they're all closed. So this, this is a, a nice thing to have. Uh, if we want to translate, so I mentioned this bijection on the previous page about uh, uh, algebraic sets and affine K algebras. So if we want to translate this, this topological notion about irreducibility into a uh, uh, algebraic notion about the affine algebra, it turns out that the right notion is, is saying that the uh, uh, affine K algebra is an integral domain. In other words, this ideal a function is vanishing on X is a prime ideal. Um, yeah, oh, that's the alarm. So let's take a break soon. Let me just finish this slide here. So one thing to note is uh, that if X is irreducible, then, it, then it's connected. Uh, that's pretty easy to see, but it's not true the other way around. So this is an example of a, a variety that's connected but uh, reducible. Um, By connected. In what uh, sense do you mean? In the topo Zariski topology? Yeah, in the Zariski topology, yeah. Okay. Okay, so I think this is a good place to take a five minute break. So let's come back in five minutes, I guess at uh, 3.10. Yeah.
All right. Um, let's get started again. Any questions so far? Okay, so then let's go on. So next concept is uh, localization of rings. So again, if I guess if everybody here has done a course on groups, rings, and fields, then this should be something familiar. So if we have a commutative ring and a multiplicative uh, set in that commutative ring, so it just means it's closed under multiplication. Um, also, it contains one, but may, yeah, that's important. Uh, and so then the, the localization of the ring at this multiplicative set is a quotient of R cross S by an equivalence relation uh, and um, given as follows. And so you should think of this as the pair RS going to the quotient R over S, this fraction. And that, that indicates that this is the right, um, if you think about uh, multiplication and addition of fractions, that tells you that this is the right uh, relation. Uh, and if we, uh, so some examples of, of this localization procedure. So if we have a non-zero element in the, in the ring, then we can localize at that element, which means we just take the multiplicative set uh, generated by that element. So one R, R squared, R cubed and so forth, and invert that multiplicative, localize at that multiplicative set. So that just, that amounts to saying that R is invertible. So we can, uh, we have an inverse for R. And also if we have a prime ideal in R, then the complement R minus, this is just the, the sets, uh, R minus P, that's a multiplicative set that that's follows from the primality of p and we can invert at that multiplicative set and that's the localization of r at p okay so again uh, uh, if you've seen this great if not then uh, um, take a look at this and when we when we actually use these localizations i'll try to say some more things about it okay so going back to um, the bijection so we have algebraic sets over K and those are in bijection with these affine K algebras. So this is like a bridge between topology or geometry and, and commutative algebra. Uh, and we haven't said anything about morphisms. So one motivating question is how does this bijection interact with morphisms? So if, if, uh, if we have a uh, morphism between K algebras, that's a K algebra homomorphism then we see that we get induced, uh, an induced continuous map from X to Y. So the, it's reversed. So here we go from KY to KX. Here we go from X to Y. And how do we define this map? Well, I'll leave it to you, but the idea is that we use this bijection between X and, and the maximum ideals of its affine algebra. And the fact that if we have a maximum ideal in, uh, in Y, in, oh, sorry, in X, uh, in the affine algebra of X, then it's uh, inverse image under this K algebra homomorphism is a maximal ideal of affine algebra of Y. So yeah, so those are the ingredients you can, you can uh, put it together from there to, to see that this is a map. And in fact, it's a continuous map with this risky topology. Uh, but, the, but the issue is that not every continuous map from X to Y arises in this way. So if we just have some continuous map um, between these algebraic sets with those risky topologies, there's no guarantee that it's coming from a, a K algebra homomorphism between their affine algebras. And we want to be able to characterize which continuous maps come from uh, uh, algebra homomorphisms. So that's one motivating question. Uh, the other motivating question uh, is this, uh, uh, this kind of analogy with manifold geometry. So in, in a class on manifolds, you learn that manifolds are locally Euclidean, uh, but we wanna think about 
um, in this setting, uh, topological spaces, so more than just sets, so I wrote sets here, but really it should be topological uh, spaces that are locally algebraic set with the Zariski topology. And uh, so these are two motivating questions, and it turns out that the key to addressing both of these questions is to use the language of sheaves. Uh, now, I, I don't think it's so crucial that uh, everybody is proficient in sheaves to uh, do well in, in this course um, in al algebraic groups, but I still do want to say a few things about sheaves um, because I think it would be helpful to have a first pass. Uh, so if we have an algebraic set X over K, uh, what we'll do is we'll define the sheaf of K-valued regular functions on, on X. And um, the, the, the thing about sheaves is that they capture more than just global functions. So we have this algebra KX that captures the global functions on X, but open subsets of X could have more functions. So for example, uh, let's look, at, let's think about this example here. If we have X being K2, so an algebraic uh, set that's just a two dimensional vector space, then it's, it's affine algebra, just polynomials and two variables. And if we have a principal open set, uh, in fact, the, the principal open set corresponding to the variable Z, so variables are Z and W here, if we have the principal open set corresponding to Z, that's just the, the set of pairs where Z is non-zero. Uh, that's, that's an open set in the Zariski topology. And we can make the observation that on, on U itself, we have more functions. So any, any function on X defines a function on U. That's, that's clear. Any polynomial in two variables defines a function on this set here, but there are more functions. In particular, z can be in invertible. So um, if we, yeah, if we we can define uh, uh, a, we can think about the localization of this algebra of functions on x, where this z is invertible, and now that that um, algebra of functions is um, is we can plug in anything from U into that, into a polynomial of that shape and get something well-defined. Uh, I hope this is somewhat clear. If it's not clear, I can explain it again. Uh, but the notation you is- Please explain again. Uh, yeah, so, okay. So um, this, so we have X being K2 and it's algebra functions as polynomials and two variables. Uh, and this subset U is the subset of pairs. So maybe I should have used some different different notation here. Um, so maybe I can fix this quickly here. So if we have a, so another notation for this would be pairs A B uh, in in K which is our x such that a uh, sorry, see, a is not equal to zero. Um, so um, so it's just points in this in this two-dimensional vector space where the first coordinate is not equal to zero. And now uh, functions on this space are given by this localization. Why is that? Well, because, in this localization, this variable z is invertible. So for example, we have in particular the, the function z inverse. And we can't, this function z inverse is not defined on all of x because uh, x contains points where the first variable is equal to zero, but it's completely fine on this space u because we know that the first uh, variable is always not equal to zero. So we can, we can plug it into a function that requires dividing by the first variable because we're guaranteed that it's not equal to zero, so that we don't encounter any problems. So that's why this uh, subset U has more functions than X. It's, it, and its functions are in fact given by this localization. And this is the notation that we'll use. So is that, is that, uh, is that better? Uh, 
who asked the question? Okay. All right, so this is the notation we'll use, this O sub X saying that we're on X and U is our open subset. And this is the algebra, the localization. So- Why and, did you just, uh, I have a question about- Sure. Uh, the variable here, okay, RZ and W, right? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, and I, so I understand the notations right now. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and this is a capital X. Um, so yeah. So in 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 general, if we have an algebraic set X, and we have its affine algebra K brackets X, and we have a non-zero polynomial, non-zero just element in this in this um, algebra, then we have on the one hand we have the principal open set which is all the points where this function is non-zero. On the other hand, we have this localization of this ring at this function. And uh, uh, the idea is that this localization should be functions on this set because here in this localization, F, F is invertible, which means that we, get, we encounter problems if we have to plug in some, something where F is zero. But on this open set, we're guaranteed that everything is uh, non-zero when we when we apply f to it and so we can um, we, it, we can uh, uh, take anything in here and apply it to uh, this principal open set here um, and yeah so that's that's the that's the idea of this uh, uh, this so these are called the regular functions at uh, this principle open set. And so now the claim is, and I, I don't want to spend too much time here, but it, I think I just flash it and if you can digest it, great. If not, then don't worry about it too much. Uh, the idea is that this definition naturally extends to a well-defined assignment from every open subset. So not just principal open subset, but general open, the risky open subset of an algebraic set to an algebra, which I call O sub X of U. And uh, this is the K algebra of regular functions on X. So basically on the, so there's always this dictionary between the geometry and the algebra. On the uh, geometry side, we're taking open subsets. Maybe we're taking smaller and smaller open subsets. On the, on the algebra side, we're localizing. So we're actually taking bigger and bigger algebras because when we localize, we usually get more things. Um, okay, and this this assignment has the property that if we if we have W, an open subset of V, which is an open open subset contained in U, then we can uh, restrict our functions from U to V and then from V to W, uh, and that's the same as uh, restricting directly from U to uh, w. Uh, so one can say this in terms of localizations, then the arrows will be, uh, um, well, no, you, you, there won't be a reverse. You can say this in terms of localization. Let me not do it right now. Uh, and it, then it has this, this property that these, these functions are determined by local data. Um, so if we have a open subset and a cover of this open subset, then uh, we can take, um, oh, I changed notation here. Okay, so this curly F should be just O sub X. And if we take a function on U, we can restrict it to any, to this, every element of this open sub, open cover, every U alpha. And then we can further restrict to any intersection. And uh, what we, what, what the condition is, is that if, if we restrict it to all the open subsets and they all coincide, then, um, oh, wait, sorry. Uh, the condition is as, as, as following. So this map is, is restricting and, oh, sorry, the conditions are over here. Um, yeah, if we, if we take a function and we uh, uh, restrict it to all the open sets, and then we restrict it to all the mutual intersections. We can, we can restrict to a mutual intersection in two ways. 
we can either first go to alpha and then to the intersection alpha and beta, or first go to u beta and then to the intersection u alpha and u beta. And if we if we know that um, the the on the other hand, if we know that if we have uh, functions here on all the u alphas that behave nicely with respect to intersections, then we know that we have a global function on all of u. Okay, so. Uh, let me not dwell on this too much because it's not super crucial, but this is the definition of a, a this is basically uh, checking the conditions in the definition of a sheaf. And what we get is that this OX is the, she is the sheaf on X. Uh, and so it's an assignment of a open of a K algebra to every open set satisfying certain properties. Um, and yeah, that's what it is. And then this uh, pair x together with this sheaf is an example of a ringed space. Um, and the, the ringed spaces that arise uh, specifically from algebraic sets with uh, regular functions are called affine algebraic varieties over k. So this, this notion of, of sheaves and, and uh, on topological spaces is, is very general. But for our purposes, we're only going to be uh, considering uh, algebraic sets. Those are uh, the topological spaces we're considering so far. Uh, and uh, the sheaf will be just the sheaf of regular functions. And this, this data of algebraic sets with the notion of functions on them, not just global functions, but how functions restrict open sets, that's called uh, uh, affine algebraic variety. Um, and yeah, so that's what an affine algebraic variety is, an algebraic set together with some uh, fancy things about what functions are on this set. Okay, so is that okay? Any questions? Okay, so uh, in Springer, there's a theorem that shows that uh, the function, the regular functions assigned to the set X, this X as an open subset of itself is just the affine K algebra. Isn't this by the definition because you take the one polynomial? Yeah, yeah, this is it, the way I set it up. It's by definition, the way they do it in Springer is uh, a bit different and there you have to prove it. But I guess the way I, I showed it is by definition pretty much. Yeah, I'm sure because I took it as definition, there's more work to be done with defining things precisely, but uh, luckily I'm not going into detail. If you're interested, then um, section 1.4 in Springer spells this out. Okay, so I said that one, that one motivating thing for thinking about sheaves is morphisms. So how do we, how do we say things, how do we say morphisms now that we have this, uh, uh, language of sheaves. So if we have a K-algebra homomorphism, then as I said before, there's an induced map from X to Y. Uh, and for any F in the, in the affine algebra for Y, uh, we have that, um, so first of all, how, how does, what, what happens with the principal open sets under this map? Well, it turns out that the principal open set for F, so that lives on Y. Its inverse image is the principal open set of gamma of F, where gamma is this map. So uh, when we have an induced map, it, it behaves nicely with respect to these principal open sets. And um, elaborating on this definition, so this is something maybe a bit uh, um, geometric. If we, if we think about the algebras that are going on here, so if we have F in the affine algebra for Y, then we can localize to uh, get this localization. On the other hand, we can, we can apply gamma to F and then we can localize and get this localization. And by properties of localization, this, there's an induced map here and this diagram commutes. So now how do we say these things in terms of these, these sheaves? Of functions, well, the global functions on Y, so this map gamma gives us uh, uh, algebra homomorphism 
between the global functions. But if we restrict to functions in this principal open set, then this, uh, um, and, and we restrict the functions from X to the corresponding principal open set here. So this is again controlled by just an F that's in, in the affine algebra of, of Y. Then we get an induced map and this commutes. So, um, uh, yeah. So, um, more generally, so this was for the principal opens, but it, in fact, for the for any open subset of Y, we get this similar diagram. So we have the this this should be gamma here, this gamma between the um, global functions. We restrict it to the local functions here and the local functions here. We get an induced map that commutes. Okay, so a morphism of ring spaces. Is, uh, is a continuous map from X to Y, such that this diagram that I, that I uh, uh, showed above commutes for, for any open subset of Y. So in case you can't read here, so this is the global functions on Y, the, the global, the, um, the sheaf assigns a K algebra to the Y as an open subset of itself. Uh, and we get a, um, we, we uh, get an induced map uh, here. So this induced map is pullback of functions and that commutes with these appropriate restrictions when we have an open subset of Y. So again, maybe um, it takes some time to kind of digest what this, what this diagram is saying, but it's, it's um, the, the idea is that if we just have any continuous map, it won't have uh, nice properties, but if we if we think about uh, the topological space X, affine variety X with a, with a sheaf, and Y with a sheaf, then we we um, can restrict what continuous maps uh, we're looking at in a in a smart way. And the upshot of this, so yeah, it's it's um, technical stuff. But the upshot is that any morphism between two ringed spaces, uh, uh, two affine varieties, which are in particular ring spaces, is, is given by a K algebra homomorphism. And if we, if we have such a morphism, then the corresponding K algebra homomorphism will just be pullback of global functions. And if we have a K algebra homomorphism, then we do this uh, procedure that I alluded to uh, uh, a few slides ago. Okay. So in fact, we get a um, uh, we get an equivalence of categories in this way, as I mentioned before, and uh, the arrow going the other direction. So the arrow going in this direction is uh, taking global functions, taking the affine algebra. The arrow going in the other direction is called spec. Uh, we won't talk about it in this class. I just wanted to uh, point this out. Um, you can pretty much forget uh, that I said categories anywhere. Um, I just wanted to make a few remarks. Uh, if we have uh, a ringed space, then and we have a point X in the, in the ring space, then we can talk about sort of functions. Uh, remember that the, the sheaf only tells us functions on open subsets, but if we wanna talk about some, some sort of functions on X, so in differential geometry, you learn about germs of functions. This is kind of like germs of functions at X, at the little, little X. Then we take the limit over all, uh, uh, open subsets containing X uh, under inclusion. I guess it's the inverse limit uh, of these um, ringed of these K algebras corresponding to each of the open subsets. So this is a, a, a local ring and we can describe this local ring as the localization of the, of the affine algebra of X at this maximal ideal. So this looks kind of scary, but we're just taking the maximal ideal 
and saying that everything outside of that maximal ideal is invertible. Um, yeah. So yeah, and to get some familiarity, you can look at these exercises. Uh, I don't think I'll assign any of those as exercises to turn in, but I think they're nice exercises. Where are these exercises in on those numbers? In Springer, Springer. Uh, the book you said. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any questions about this material so far? Okay, so uh, one note about products. How do we take the products of, of two uh, affine varieties? Well, it amounts to taking tensor products. So uh, we need to know that, the, that uh, um, the property of being reduced is preserved. It's also helpful to know that the property of being integral domains is preserved when taking tensor products. Um, but those are. And just to remind you, if we have two uh, algebras, A and B, then their tensor product, this is over K. So these are both K algebras. Their tensor product is again an algebra where the multiplication happens component-wise. So A1 tensor B1, where A1 is in A, B1 is in B times A2 tensor B2 is A1 times A2 tensor B1 times B2. So that's it on simple tensors and it extends to uh, general tensors. And this operation of taking tensor product corresponds to uh, taking products of varieties under the, that dictionary that I, that I mentioned. So um, yeah, maybe I'll uh, kind of, you can read this in the notes, but the upshot is that the, um, the tensor product of the, so the tensor product of these two algebras is the product, there's the affine algebra for the product of these two varieties. And to get some more familiarity, you can look at these exercises in the Springer 1.5.5, exercises one and two. Okay. So now, now I think we covered the first motivating question, which was about morphisms. Um, how do we talk about morphisms of, of algebraic sets? And we saw that we needed to enhance the structure. We needed to keep track of more things, keep track of the functions. And then we got this nice perfect bijection between morphisms of affine algebraic varieties and algebra homomorphisms between their um, affine algebras. So the second motivating question was how to think about things that are not just affine. How do we think about, just like we, we have um, manifolds being uh, Hausdorff topological spaces that are locally homeomorphic to Euclidean space. How do we think about topological spaces that are locally given by solutions to polynomial equations that are locally get affine algebraic varieties? So let's just jump in. So the, the definition is the following. So an, uh, a variety is a quasi-compact ringed space. So quasi-compact means every cover has a finite subcover. And it has the, it satisfies the following conditions. So first of all, it's what's known as a pre-variety. So this means it's locally an affine K variety for any, any point in the topological space. There's an open neighborhood such that if we take that open neighborhood U and we restrict the, the uh, the regular functions to that open neighborhood U as a sheaf, then we get something that's isomorphic to an affine K variety. So this is a local uh, uh, locality axiom, but we also need a separation axiom, which uh, is the analog of the, of the Hausdorff condition for uh, general manifolds. And that's that the diagonal is closed in X cross X. Um, yeah, so I said uh, what quasi-compact means, and yeah, separation axiom is an analog to the Hausdorff condition. If we happen to have a variety that's actually Hausdorff, it's just a finite set of points, so Hausdorff isn't really relevant in this setting. 
okay. So some consequences of this is that if we have a variety and y is a pre-variety, I won't be talking about pre-varieties after, after this lecture, but if y is a pre-variety, then this graph, uh, and so we have, and we have a morphism between these two um, uh, varieties or pre-varieties, then this graph is closed in uh, y cross x. So the graph is an important tool that we use. Uh, Sorry, okay. Get... What is the difference between the, the definition of variety and a pre-variety? So pre-variety does not necessarily satisfy the separation axiom. So pre-variety only satisfies this locality axiom and it's not necessarily, mm -hmm. uh, doesn't and have the said, separation. And did you say you can get a variety from a pre-variety or, or you didn't? I don't know if uh, it's possible even. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure if it's, I think there's maybe something you can do, but it's not, it's not something we'll, we'll be concerned about. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, also, so, okay, morphisms are kind of rigid. So if we have two morphisms between varieties or Y well, can be a pre-variety, I guess. If we have two morphisms between varieties and they coincide on a dense set of Y, then they must be equal. So there's no sort of, uh, almost equal, almost everywhere or anything. If we, they coincide on a dense set, that they're equal. Um, and this is a criterion I think we might use uh, at various points in the class. So it's a useful uh, criterion for checking whether something is a variety. So if, um, if we have a pre-variety, so if we know that something is locally uh, uh, affine variety, so it's um, that's usually not too hard to show. We just have defined an open cover by some uh, affine open subsets. But if we know that this open, if we want to know that this open cover actually, um, uh, we can use this open cover to 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 show that the the thing that's a pre variety is actually a variety to show to check the separation axiom indirectly. And we do that in the following way. So we think about each intersection, ui intersect uj, and this, this should be a finite cover. And we think about the images when we restrict. So these are functions on U, ui, these are functions on ui intersect uj. And as I said before, they're, they're, when we get to a smaller uh, subset, there's often more functions because we can localize um, so there, there'll be points where that are not in there and we can do some localization. So we get something bigger and we can, yeah. So we can think about UI inside this functions on UI inside of functions on the intersection and functions on UJ inside this, inside of function on the intersection. If, and if these two images together generate this entire algebra of functions on the intersection, then we have a variety. And it's if and only. So yeah, if um, these exercises aren't super important for what comes later in the class, but if you want to think about some more things in this direction, uh, feel free to take a look. Okay, uh, so projective varieties will definitely come up later in the course, so it's important to have. What do you mean? Uh, what do you mean by, by generate? in where? Ah, uh, good, good question. Uh, generate as algebras. So, um, so if we take uh, the image of this, so the image of this will be a subalgebra here. The image of this will be another subalgebra here. And now if we allow ourselves to multiply um, elements in, in the first one with elements in the second uh, and take linear combinations, of things mean by three? Three um, something. Kind of like that, yeah. So if, um, uh, yeah, you can think about the the, the uh, tensor product of these two algebras, okay. and it it maps to this algebra, and um, 
Yeah, I mean, you can think about the free algebra generated by these two algebras. It maps into this algebra, and if that map is a surjection, then they generate. That's one way you can say it. Um, yeah. But often there's a more, often in applications, it'll be kind of clear that we get everything. Okay, so projective varieties are, are so are, yeah, they're the, the kind of the first example we see of non-affine varieties. So things that are not just given by uh, a subset of a vector space carved out by polynomials, they're, they're locally given that way, but not globally. Uh, so, so if we have, so yeah, so uh, maybe you've seen this definition before. If we have um, uh, a vector space of dimension uh, n plus one, and we think of lines in that vector space, then um, projective space is just the set of all lines. Now, um, more another way to think about it is if we take any non-zero point in this n plus one dimensional vector space, so anything in here, then there's a unique line going through that point. There's a unique line connecting that point to zero. So these are lines that go through zero, lines through the origin, one dimensional subspaces. Uh, and uh, so there's a unique line, but any scalar multiple, if we multiply that point, if we apply the scalar multiplication in the vector space, uh, and we apply the scalar multiplication by some non-zero point, then we get something that's on the same line. Uh, uh, of course, if we multiply by zero, we get, um, we, all lines go through zero, so that's not allowed. But if we multiply by anything in K star, we get that same line. Uh, and we get all the points on the line. Uh, and so that's the, that's the idea behind how we identify Pn, projective space of dimension n, with this quotient of uh, n plus one dimensional vector space minus the origin mod the scaling action of the multiplicative group. And to define the, the structure of, al of an algebraic variety on Pn, we need a bit of a notation. So first of all, um, if we have, so first of all, the homogeneous coordinates. So this, this first uh, piece here defines the homogeneous coordinates. So if we have any point in this non-zero point in this vector space, we can think about its image in P1. So this is this, this point up to scaling. We can scale all the coordinates by the same uh, scalar and we get the same point. So I think Springer uses this notation star. I'm used to thinking about it in terms of these uh, colons, homogeneous coordinates. Um, and now for each i from zero to n, we get, we define this open subset of Pn, which is uh, the set of all uh, all points, uh, all points given in terms of homogeneous coordinates where the ith coordinate is non-zero. So you can think about these homogeneous coordinates. If, if the ith coordinate is non-zero in one presentation, then if we multiply things by scalars, it will stay, it will stay non-zero. So this is well defined. And in fact, this UI is uh, is isomorphic as a algebraic variety to a n. So this is a map that, that takes you from ui to an. So we can, since xi is non-zero, we, uh, we can just multiply all the other coordinates by its inverse and skip. So here we skip xi itself. So that, that um, takes the number of coordinates down to n instead of n plus one. And you can show that this map phi i is well-defined and bijective. And, and as such, you can transport the structure of an affine algebraic variety on AN to each UI. And then um, you can think about, now we wanna check this criterion that I mentioned. And you can think about identifying uh, um, the algebra functions on AN with this polynomial algebra. So we saw that before. And what about the intersection? Well, the intersection uh, of ui and uj, we think about this intersection inside 
And we, we think about this intersection inside of UI and apply this map phi i. So this is happening inside of UI and we apply the map uh, phi i. And if you work it out, we get that this, uh, what is this image inside of U of A n? So phi i maps into A n. And it's a principal open set if i is not equal to j. And if i is equal to j, we get the whole algebra of functions. And um, now uh, this, this implies in particular that these, uh, um, these uh, if, if, yeah, I mean, okay, I won't spell it out, but if you think about the criterion that I mentioned previously, we can, um, oh, I guess that's the next step. Yeah, that's the next step. So uh, if we, we, these UIs cover PN and uh, they define a topology on PN and a sheaf of regular functions on, on PN, that should be PN. So I'm omitting the details there. And this tells us that PN is a pre-variety because it has this locality condition. It's locally isomorphic to each of these uh, affine open subsets. And then we, we use this criterion that um, I mentioned previously. Uh, you can work through it and you see that these are, um, PN is a variety. Um, so actually this, I think this exercise I may assign later, I'll, I'll let you know. But these are, yeah, it's PN is pretty crucial to understand. Uh, I have a question just about sure. the criteria. Um, mm -hmm. This criteria is exactly like the gluing criteria, the consequence, or even more, because you, where is the separateness coming from? Uh, it's not really, I, there's some similarities, but I think it's, it's kind of philosophically, it's different. Um, yeah, it's not really. I mean, okay, if you go, if in some high level, maybe it's it's somewhat similar, but I think, I think it's uh, for for the level of generality for this class, it's it's kind of different. Okay. So uh, I want to say a bit about projective varieties in general. Um, so for this, we need to know a little bit more about uh, projective space. So. Um, I said that projective space is uh, the quotient of polynomials of, uh, sorry, of uh, vector space of dimension n plus one uh, minus zero. Uh, and it's the quotient by the scaling action of, of um, the most primitive group of the field. So now let's, let's think back to this, to, to this vector space of dimension n plus one. So it's algebra functions is these polynomials in n plus one variables that I'll call t zero to tn. And as you have probably seen, the, any monomial has a well-defined degree. So if we have a monomial, everything commutes, so we can rearrange it so that it's t0 to some power, t1 to some power, tn to some power. And its degree is just the sum of, the, of these powers. That's it. Uh, and so we can think of, of, of this polynomial algebra S as being the direct sum over uh, these SDs, where SD, where D runs, runs over the non-negative integers. And each SD is just the, the, the polynomials, the homogeneous polynomials of degree D. So saying, a, so every monomial is homogeneous because it has a well-defined degree. Saying that a polynomial is homogeneous is saying that each, each of its monomial uh, constituents are homogeneous of the same degree or yeah, each of its uh, monomial, co uh, um, monomial components are, have the same degree. And so if we take, if we can let SD be the span just as a vector space of all monomials of degree D, and then we get this direct sum decomposition. I guess this is, yeah, this is not too bad. So for example, if N equals two, then, um, any, any homogeneous polynomial of degree three is some linear combination of these four monomials and so forth. Um, and yeah, as an aside, this is what's known as a graded algebra because if we take a monomial of homogeneous 
polynomial degree d d1 and a homogeneous polynomial of degree d2, and we multiply them together, we get a homogeneous polynomial of degree d1 plus d2. Uh, but yeah, that's just an aside. So what do we do with these homogeneous polynomials? Well, if um, the next step is to define what it means for an ideal to be homogeneous. So an ideal is homogeneous if it's generated by homogeneous elements. Um, there's yeah, there's different characterizations of, of uh, what a homogeneous ideal is, but this is one of them. It's generated by homogeneous elements. Um, and the other thing we want to define is uh, principal open, uh, uh, not, not principal open, a closed subset of um, projective space corresponding to every homogeneous ideal of, of this ring S. So if we have a homogeneous, a proper homogeneous ideal I inside S, S is the polynomial algebra in n plus one variables, then we can define the, its vanishing set as all the X's in, in Pn, such that X belongs to the vanishing set of the ideal inside Kn plus one, so upstairs. So I think this diagram is, is important to keep in mind. So we have so this, this is the quotient map from Kn plus one minus zero to Pn. And here, if we have any ideal, then it defines a closed subset. But if it's a homogeneous ideal, then we think about its quotient. And, uh, and that defines an open subset of Pn. Uh, yeah, so the upshot here is that homogeneous ideals in S uh, Give, give us the closed subsets of Pn plus one. So this, th there's something to prove here because we define the topology uh, independently in terms of um, the, uh, this cover. So there's something to show here, uh, but this turns out to be the case. There's a, there's a surjective map here and we can, we can uh, make it a bijection if we think about radical homo homogeneous ideals. So now what's a projective variety? A projective variety is a closed subvariety of some Pn. Uh, and a quasi-projective variety is an open subvariety sub of a projective variety. So it's, this ter terminology seems somewhat arbitrary and confusing, but we'll, this is, we'll get used to it. Okay, so I think we're almost out of time. Maybe let me just say a few words about the, uh, what dimension means. Um, there are several ways to think about dimension of a, of a variety. So first of all, if it's affine and irreducible, then um, as I said before, uh, so we had this notion of irreducibility of, of uh, topological spaces. And uh, I made this note that if, if, if uh, X is an irreducible, uh, set or uh, then this affine algebra of X is an integral domain. Uh, so any integral domain has a well-defined field of fractions. So we can set the dimension of X to be the transcendence degree of this field of fractions over K. So um, yeah, so there's no problems when X is affine and irreducible. So if X is, is, is no longer affine, but still irreducible, then we know that for every affine open, the algebra, uh, affine algebra of that affine open is an integral domain. And uh, one can show that if we have two affine open subsets, then, there, then the field of fractions of their um, affine algebras are canonically identified. And this gives us a well-defined notion of the field of fractions of X and we can set the dimension to be the transcendence degree of this field over K. And finally, if X is arbitrary, so now it's no longer irreducible. Uh, but as I said before, there's finite and many irreducible components. We can set the dimension to be the maximum dimension of the uh, dimensions of the irreducible components. The maximum of the dimensions of the irreducible components. Yes, I said that right. Okay, and um, that's the dimension of X. Um, yeah, and if, if um, X is affine, 
then um, we can characterize the dimension in terms of the um, maximum number of linearly independent generators for the affine algebra. Okay, so I think the time is up. I'll pick up uh, from here next time, next week. There's just a few more algebraic geometry things I wanna mention. And then we'll dive into um, chapter two of Springer, which is introducing algebraic groups. Um, so again, if, if some of these algebraic geometry concepts are unfamiliar to you, if they're kind of scary, don't, don't worry too much. Uh, let me know if you want any suggestions for further reading. And um, yeah, feel free to email me if you have any questions. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Other, I can stick around for a few more minutes if there are uh, any questions right now. So, but if you need to leave, you can leave now. I just wanted to ask you, you will not um, use like schemes or more, more modern or maybe later on. Mm. Uh, I think I will not, um, okay. but if, I, if uh, somebody is interested, I can state things, some specific things in terms of schemes, if that's okay. helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, and a uh, reminder that the TA session will be at 10 a.m. on uh, Monday. Thank you. Okay, thanks everybody. Thank you.